Okay, welcome to Monday, April 26, our class session, Elementary Statistics. This is the last week of the semester. And you know everything that we're doing here in this last week. I'll scan it quickly for you in a second. But all of the business that you have left to complete, we've described in our email, and we have it written on our website. These two class sessions this week are strictly review sessions for you and your questions, and not mandatory at all. But I will be here to answer your questions. And other than that, I will just mark time and grade papers here at my own desk, because I'm not going to force you to ask questions or talk about something else that you have no interest in, do problems that you do not want to see done. So just let me hit the highlights. Tonight, by 11.59, you're going to be finished with the work you can perform in Newton Alta. So that'll be closed tonight, 11.59 p.m. and I'll record your portion of the grade there. You have submitted your last homework last Monday. I'm finishing up the grading now, so it could be that tonight I'll have that returned to you with a current grade report. You have your exam posted on our website right now, and I'll show you that exam in a second. So that began Friday night, and you were alerted Friday night when that was posted. That is due this Friday, April 30, 11.59 p.m. So you may already be working on that. You may have questions related to that, and that's fine. If I cannot answer a question, I'll just honestly directly tell you I can't answer it. If you looked at the test, you've seen that the problems are essentially out of the book. Maybe one or two of them look odd, but different, but the majority of them are like out of the book as they were before. Okay, so just to make sure that everybody here or later in the recording can see this, I'm going to go to the browser just show you exactly where the exam is. Just like the first two exams, nothing different. So this is going to look familiar. Make sure I got my screen going. Math 208. Introduction to week 16. Here's a link to exam three right here. But if you go into exam uh, into week 16, you see the ordinary links here and under your assessments. So too many links. Maybe I should just have one exam three link. They all point to the same document. So this is exam three. The instructions are the exact same instructions you've used for the first two times. Nothing different there, but I do need you to sign and return this cover page. And then there are six problems just as the first two exams had six problems. Okay, so that covers that. The reminder about your Newton Alta, assign Newton Alta assignments that are you need to complete by tonight, 11.59. No more written homework. The solutions to the previous written homework are on week 15 page. And I urge you to review those because is people had questions about these tests, a linear regression test, exactly what it meant for R to be significant, exactly what something means to be an outlier. I tried to demonstrate that completely here on the solutions. Outlier was a special reference to points that lie outside this band plus or minus 2s. In order to do that, you have to calculate the value of s. 
the standard deviation of the residuals. So, and, and the calculator calculates this for you, but you cannot just pick points that are a certain distance from the line. So on the, on the homework that you just submitted, a lot of people pick these last two points as outliers because they were farther away on the horizontal axis. Now, outlier means outside this band and there was only one point that was outside this band. Okay, so anyway, make sure you read through that carefully so you know how to perform those tests. When you submit your exam, you submit it to the assignments folder just like normal. Then I will grade it, return it to your folder with your returned papers and put in a final grade report for you. When I do that, I will send out an email announcing that the final grade report and your graded exam are posted. Okay, excuse the very brief introduction because I don't want to use up any of your time. I will let you bring any question you want. And other than that, I'm just gonna work here at my own desk, grading papers, cleaning up papers. So thank you for your attention. Okay, let me look at that. Okay, that's a fair question. Let me see. Let's first of all, let's look at the question. Let me get it out. And let me see if we can find something similar to look at. Thank you for the question. Uh, let me pull up the exam here and share it with you if we need to share it. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I got six. Okay. So let me make some comment on this and let me also share it with you on the screen. So we all see the same thing. So we get this piece of paper over here and get ready to share it. Good, there's kind of an entertainment aspect to this 
but there's also a serious aspect to this. So just reading through it with you, you have a friend who's convinced that over time, the federal government pressured states to shorter, you shorter and shorter names as they join the union. I, what do you want to call this? A conspiracy theory or whatever you want to call it. But they're convinced because they know and they have data. How many people are you gonna meet who just know something, whether it's true or not? You know, it's a tough, that's a tough nut to crack. You can't convince people sometimes of the things that they know that aren't so. But you can decide whether you're gonna believe it yourself. So they say, if you took the names of the states and the year that they joined the union, this person says, as time went on, the state names got shorter and shorter. It's easy to find examples of that. Of course, Massachusetts has got a lot of letters in it. One of the early states. Utah, one of the later states, not the latest. Alaska is later, Hawaii was later. Utah's only got four letters. So you could imagine plotting all the data about the year that a state joined and the number of letters in the state's name. And you could actually check whether as time went on, the average names got shorter and shorter. And I'll write this something on my paper in a second. But there's a big difference between saying, oh, here's a bunch of data and here's a least squared regression line, making a scatter plot, that's in part B, creating the least squared regression line, that's in part C. But does that prove anything? What about the other pieces of data about the least squared regression line? The correlation coefficient, the determination coefficient, the outliers, the residuals, all the other words that are discussed in chapter 12, illustrated in our most recent homework 11. Does that convince you that there must have been some other reason that, or some external reason that names were shortened? Or does the data not support this theory? I don't want to call it a crazy theory, or it's just, does the data support this theory or not? So let me go to my paper and see what I can illustrate. So, uh, depending on how you organize the state names. Let me write this down for everybody, whether they're here or later. And let me paraphrase your question, you know, comment on problem six. If this doesn't do it for you, then you can follow up. You know, I can I clearly can find online or an encyclopedia or in a library, I can find a list of all of the states and the year that they joined the union. So I'll leave that completely up to you. You know, Alabama. What year did they join the union? Off the top of my head, I don't know. How many letters are in the name? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right?
not hard to count the letters in the name. I don't think it's hard to find the year that Alabama joined the Union either. And probably you could find in many places just a list of all the states and when they joined. You know, somewhere down near the end of your list. Apparently, the question says Utah joined in 1896. And that has four letters in it. So let me read the question again. The year of joining is the independent variable. The number of letters is the dependent variable. Make a scatter plot, do a least squares regression line. Independent variable, horizontal axis. Dependent variable is the vertical axis. I'm just drawing some random dots right now. And I certainly don't have as many dots here as I have states in the union. But is there a trend that the state names got shorter as time went on? And then is that trend strong? Is the trend significant? Those are two different words that the book used. That is how I read the question. So if you want to follow up, I don't mind. Uh, is it how to find the list of names? Is it how to decide how you're going to answer part D? That is really, part D is really kind of a small summary of the course. You know, every day we have to decide, is this information mean something or not? So I want you to comment in part D, what you would do with that information. Is it meaningful? Is it significant? Does it point to something else that's happening? Or do you have another explanation you could have another explanation, but it can't be, oh no, it wasn't the federal government, it was the aliens. No, I mean, when I say your explanation should be persuasive, I mean, your explanation should be serious, meaningful. It should use the information you discover and construct. When I say use a short paragraph, I mean, it does not have to be a novel. It does not have to be long in order to be a good explanation. I just want you to make a serious explanation using the information you have at hand, not theorizing, oh, no, the government couldn't have done that, or no, I think that they did it because there were more independent states than dependent states. I have no idea what other explanations people could come up with. I want you to come up with an explanation based on the actual information you find. I'm rambling too much. And so I may have answered or not answered. So you, you can follow up if you like. Uh, that's a good question. Does the, does the, uh, the problem does address that? Good. Okay, good question. So let me share the screen again. Just make sure we're all reading the same problem in the same way. So I think you're asking a good question. 
Let me write it down. Sample. States. Or use all states. And I'm showing you the question right now. Uh, it's a good question because we've done both. We've done sampling and other things. And both could be legitimate, but I'm going to go with the problem here. Where is my pen? It's not there. No, the problem says all. The, or the problem says create a table that shows when each state in the United States joined the union. So I want all the states, not just a sample. Whether or not you could use samples in your explanation, I'll leave that open. I didn't think of that necessarily, but uh, it could be done, but but I, I don't want to prejudice you one way or the other. But the table, the scatter plot, the regression line, the question clearly says each state. Okay. Out of there. Let me write down that. Each so each state, all states, that's the same thing. The, the question is asking for all the states. Okay, that's a fair question.
Sorry, I had my microphone phone off for a second there. I'm looking at your question. Uh, if you have an example, but but your your job is to perform the hypothesis test on the dice. Let me write this question down and see if I can make a comment. Uh, you're referring to question one. Are the die fair? Uh, and right now, I do not have any dice on my desk. Why did I put the dice back? But, but don't matter. We could simulate dice rolling, or I could run upstairs and get some dice. So don't worry about that. But uh, you're going to perform the hypothesis test. But let me let me say it this way. Let's take an example where I just roll one die. And I want to decide if that die is fair or not. So I know, and I'm talking about one ordinary die like you use a Monopoly or Yahtzee or whatever ordinary board game, sorry, whatever board game you're playing. Risk, one of my favorite games. So the six side die can come up one, two, three, four, or five, or six. These are the outcomes. Let's say I rolled it. 20 times. And 20 is even a good example. If this dice is fair, you expect one through six to come up equally often, right? Each number has an equal chance of coming up. Now let's say you roll the dice and you get uh, three ones, four twos, five threes, three fours, one five. Let me see what I got here. Seven, 12, 16. I'm gonna roll it 20 times and four sixes. That's very interesting. This is what you've observed. That's clearly not equal. But on the other hand, if you roll the dice 20 times, these couldn't possibly be all equal because six doesn't go into 20 evenly. You know, if it was even, maybe you'd have threes and fours show up here. What's 20 divided by six, even on the average? 10 divided by three? 3.33 threes going on forever? I guess that's what you would expect. But you say expect there in the mathematical sense. You don't seriously expect three and a third ones. Three and a third twos. Three and a third threes and so on. But now here's a question. Is this dice that I just rolled for you? Maybe I will go upstairs and grab a die. Is it a loaded die? Is it weighted so that the lower numbers come up more? Or did I just unluckily low, roll 
more lower numbers than higher numbers. And the question is, you got to decide that with just 20 rolls. Now, 20 rolls is kind of small. First of all, I think I should pick a number that divides evenly into six, so it's more obvious and easier to calculate. Okay, we could do that. But, uh, you know, if I was trying to decide if a dice was fair, I'm not sure 20 rolls is really helpful. You know, if you, you, you've all been in the place where you played Monopoly and you roll double six, then you roll double six, then you roll double six again, right? In fact, there's a rule in Monopoly. If you roll double sixes three times, if you roll a 12 three times, you go to jail, right? That's a rule. And I'm sure if you've played Monopoly or if you've heard people describe how they played, they'll tell you, sure, I've rolled double sixes three times in a row, even though that's very unlikely. So you cannot tell from just a small sample, maybe, whether any one die is fair or not. But let's say I rolled it 20,000 times. Then these numbers should be averaging out. None of them will be three and a third fraction, but they should be averaging out so that they're kind of more or less even. Now your problem in problem one, and I'm not sure I can say more than that, is uh, you're rolling two dice, you're adding them up, and you know that even adding them up means some numbers are more common than others. Rolling a 12 is rare, rolling a two is rare, snake eyes, rolling a 12, box cars. I do not gamble in the casino. I do not condone gambling in the casino. I just watch a lot of movies. <laughs> uh, you know that seven occurs frequently. That's what the game of craps is based on. So unlike this, when I roll one die, I expect each number to come up equally often. When I roll two dice and I have a sum from Anywhere lowest sum is two, highest sum is 12. They do not show up equally. So the question is, what do you expect when you roll two dice? How do you expect the distribution to look like? In the problem, I gave you an observed distribution. And the question is, what hypothesis test will tell you whether these are the same or not? And I believe this question came from chapter 11. Let me just scan quickly. That problem is not in the book, but the question we're talking about, the test we're talking about would be in chapter 11 where they describe doing things like this. I'm just going to confirm that. Yes. Chapter 11, they did problems like this, and maybe that's as much as I can say. So you can't just say, oh, these are not all the same. This dice must be loaded. You're cheating me. But what would it take? for you to notice whether someone was playing with loaded die. Have you ever even seen a loaded die? I'd have to confess, I, I don't think I ever have. I bet you could go into a magic store, or a gift store, and you could find loaded dice, but I've never even played with one. Maybe I was playing with loaded dice and I didn't know it. That's the nature of this question. Do you think you can tell? Can you tell from that data you were given? 
Okay, that's a fair question. Now, if you have any problem in chapter 11 like this, you want to pick out and do, I don't have any problem, let's do it. But, but as far as commenting on the problem, that's all a comment on the problem. You can pick out any example in there you want to do, no problem, we can do that. But I will let you pick out the problem. I won't, I don't want to prejudice you by picking one out and then somebody thinking, oh, that's the one, or oh, that's how you do it. I want to make sure that you you all choose the problem you want to look at. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you if, you, if you rolled a dice 20 times and all you came up with was ones or twos, you would guess that it was loaded, right? Let's say you rolled a dice 20 times and all you got was a one. Well, now you're suspicious, but in general, it's not gonna be so obvious. So the question is, where is that threshold? Can you statistics to find out when you're being cheated that way.
let me address that question then. Uh, what would be a good problem for the book? I'll be uh, direct. Uh, there were no die problem in the book that I saw. So not finding something like that. But let me ask you the question. What test do you think you should use? And I, I did say, yes, this problem is from chapter 11, not the problem as it's written and worded, but the kind of problem this is, is from chapter 11. So there were what tests were in chapter 11, which one do you think would fit this? Then that would help you pick out an example.
Let me answer that. I think about this carefully. So, and I'll bring up our formula sheet to show you the answer to that question or show you, show you what you should say here, possibly. Hypothesis test, you cannot answer because everything we're doing is a hypothesis test. I, I should be more specific, which hypothesis test would you do? Now, to remind you that we have many, well, at least 12, 13, 14, 15, let's pull up our formula sheet and I'll share it with you. Here's our formula sheet, it's on our website and it's Last week, or maybe a week ago or so, I showed you this part of the formula sheet called hypothesis testing. So we actually have many hypothesis tests. Yes, you need to perform a hypothesis test to do this problem from chapter 11. The question is, which one? Is it the test of a single population mean with known population standard deviation? Well, there is no discussion in this problem about standard deviation, known or unknown. So I'll throw that one out for you. Population proportion to all these tests, Z test, T test, chi squared test, and most recently, F tests. So I'm trying to count here. We had two, we had tested two variances, two F tests, two chi-squared tests, that's four, four T tests, that's eight, four Z tests. So we have at least 12 hypothesis tests. And and the reason why I'm saying this to your question, and I'll let me comment again, is this is the real business of your statistics class. Let me, because you need to be able to pick out the test. Again, I'll say which t test. So you say you narrow it down to the t test, okay, but there's four t tests. And again, I'll say this is in chapter 11. So if you look in chapter 11, what hypothesis tests we use there, that would give you uh, test significance of a correlation coefficient. Uh, that is specifically when you talk about linear regression. And there's no mention of linear regression in this problem. On your most recent homework, you did have to do the test which was a t-test for the significance of a correlation coefficient. So that's good. Now, let me make sure I have that written down there. Okay, I do. I have A, B, C, C. So I have to correct my numbering. But that was one of our 12 tests. But no, I can't use that here. I'm not doing linear regression in this problem. being a little bit obnoxious in this sense that I'm not gonna give it to you that way. But I did say it's in chapter 11. So you did problems and even on the homework, you did problems that use the test that I'm thinking about. Of course, you used all 12 of these tests somewhere in the homework more or less.
and for the sake of anyone who's checking this out recorded later, because I do not record or save or post the chat window, I was just responding to a suggestion from the chat window. Okay, let me look at that. Right, let's see how that works and what we can use that for. The question is example 11.7. And you say page 637, I'm gonna look that up. With our book, with the OpenStax book, and I'll, I'll find exactly where this is. Sometimes you have to be careful with the page numbers because different printings have different page numbers. My physical book in front of me, it is in 637. 
And this test right here in 637 is zoom, 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 a test for independent events. So this is just to help people if they got a different page number. This is chapter 11, section three, 11.7. Okay, so this is a test for independence. We've done some examples of this. This is a chi-squared test. It is a messy test in that I kind of need a calculator to perform this test. And the idea here, let me see if I can pull up the question to share it with everybody. Uh, Chapter 11, section three. Okay, I've got the question. And then they gave an answer, so we can scan the answer quickly. And I'll share it with you. Oh, wrong page. Try again. There we go. Okay, I am sharing this page with you right here. So it says in a volunteer group, adults 21 and older, volunteer from one to nine hours a week and spending time with disabled senior citizen. The program recruits from community college students, four-year college students, non-students, and everybody volunteers a different number of hours. So the question is here, the, does the number of hours you volunteer depend on whether you're a college, community college student or four-year student? Maybe the community college students volunteer the most. Maybe the non-students volunteer the most. Maybe the four-year college students volunteer the least. I do not know. I have this table in front of me. I guess many students probably volunteer, you know, seven to nine hours appears to be a lot. Nobody volunteered 79 hours the most. Four year students and non red students, they did the most they did was in the four to six hour range. So the question is are these independent? If I told you someone volunteered one to three hours, would you be able to identify whether that person was a community college student or not? by this data if I didn't tell you. So the problem is asking us to look at three conditions. Let me mark this on the paper. Community college student, four-year student, non-student, and three sets of hours. So these three conditions and these three hours, are they independent? What we have to do is use the row totals to make a table of what we expect. Let me clear those red lines off. And let me move this paper up while I'm looking at it. For example, 255 out of 839 people in the survey were community college students. So if everything was just proportional here, 298 out of 839 volunteered one to three hours. If everything was proportional, then this 298 out of 839 would tell me what number I should fill in for the 255 college students, the community college students. So if I take 298 times 839, I get a certain percentage. Let me pull out my calculator, even though I'm sharing this paper with you. Let 
298 divided by 839 is 35%, 35.5%. And if I have 255 community college students total, and I did that 35.5% times 255 college, community college students, let me see what that number would be. That number is 90.57 on my calculator. And that's what they shared in this box. So in this box here, these three categories and these three hours, what they did is they filled in the numbers they expect by doing that dividing like that. 379 out of 839 volunteered four to six hours. So among the community college students, if you take 379 divided by 839, you get 45.2%. Multiply that by 255 college students, community college students, and you get that you should have 115.19 community college students volunteering four to six hours. So these numbers in this table are the numbers you'd expect from the portions, the proportions that you have in the original totals, community college students, four-year students, non-res students, and volunteering one to three hours, four to six hours, seven to nine hours. That's how you construct these nine numbers that I've outlined in red. Now the community college students, actually 111 of them volunteered one to three hours, not 90.5. And that's not the same number. Well, just by chance, I don't think they should always be the same number. But that's what you're going to calculate now. Are these observed minus expected differences enough to tell you whether your observations are very different from what you expect? So we're just outlining this. So how are we going to proceed? What we do is we take this table and we put this into matrix on the calculator. Not the totals, just three categories and the three hours. And the calculator will take these numbers and do all of these numbers that I'm going to outline in blue. It'll calculate all of these numbers for us. It'll compare the red table and the blue table and tell you whether the red table is much different than you expect. If it's much different than you expect, then maybe the amount of hours you volunteer depends on what category you're in. But if the red table and the blue table are close enough that they're only kind of randomly different. Then the number of hours you volunteer and the type are independent. So let's see what they end up with here. They put this in the calculator. They tell you how they calculated each one of these numbers. They say they're using a chi-squared test with four degrees of freedom that comes from three minus one times three minus one. Categories both ways. Two times two is four. And then chi-squared test statistic, they produce by comparing the whole tables is 12.99. So let's look at a chi-squared distribution, four degrees of freedom, 12.99. Where is that? They're going to draw a picture. Now, you could draw the chi-squared distribution of degree four also on your calculator. It does not look like this. It, this one is kind of a generic one. It is true that it's right skewed, but I don't think it looks that round. 
Maybe I'll pull it up for you on my calculator. Anyway, it says the p-value or the area after 1299 is 0.013. That's a small probability. Are these categories independent? Well, the sample that you took, if they are independent, that was your null hypothesis that they were independent, the sample that you took is very unlikely. So you've got to choose between two things right now. Are these categories of student and volunteer hours independent? Or did you just get really unlucky with the students you surveyed? And we're going to bet against unlucky. So p-value here is less than 0 0.05. That's what they're saying right here. They calculate the probability value, you compare it to 0 0.05, since no level of significance is given, you use the standard level of significance, 0 0.05, and the p-value is less than that alpha. That means this is kind of rare. We are going to reject the null hypothesis, and these factors are not independent. Apparently, what kind of student you are does influence how many hours you volunteer, at least for this survey. Then they also show you how to put this into your calculator. Right here. Now notice, and I apologize, this is what time we have available to us right now. I'm not doing this problem with you. I was just walking you through the problem. So you put it in your calculator here. This is how you do that calculation in example 11.7. Okay, I'm gonna clear that drawing. I'm going to get rid of the annotating. So the number of hours you volunteer depends on what kind of student you are in this survey. Maybe in another survey, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna close the screen. And, uh, okay, example, calculating a correlation coefficient. Definitely, yes, well, let's, let's do that. But I got to call this over right here because we're gonna run over time. Let's make that our first example on Wednesday. That problem is chapter 12. It is not hard to calculate and your calculator will calculate it for you in the linear regression t-test. The correlation coefficient is the R. Okay. I'm going to have to cut it off right there. But let's make a note of that so that we don't forget to do it next time. And you can you can prep for Wednesday, pick out particularly which one you'd like to do, homework or from the book. You tell me which one you want to do and we'll do it. Okay, so start working on those problems, line up any other questions you want to ask and I will see you again on Wednesday. I apologize for cutting it off here, but that's what we'll do.